So um, to kind of clarify that point, uh, so I'm totally talking about my own views today. I work as a consultant for Google, and so I'm not speaking for Google. This is not what Google thinks, this is what I think. Uh, okay, so uh, this is Google Fonts. Um, I'm curious, how many of you um, have, have seen Google Fonts before? Quite a lot of you guys. Okay, most of you, nice. And um, how many of you guys are using it in your own websites? How many of you are not using it? <laughs> uh, okay, so um, uh, yeah, so, so Google Fonts, um, there's uh, lots of uh, Latin fonts, um, and uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, web fonts is relatively new kind of web design uh, technology. So for a long time, you could only use fonts which are already installed on a computer in the web page, and web fonts, um, you know, uh, change that because. Instead of being restricted to like web safe fonts, where you know you maybe had Times New Roman on a PC, Times on a Mac, and then Serif on, on other computers, and the typography would look different on every system. Um, instead of that, then we now have uh, real web fonts. So with those with those kind of classic desktop fonts, the typography of the web is often very plain. So you can see this is this is like a current magazine. Um, and this pull quote, it doesn't really, you know, pop out. The titles up there um, are, are kind of, yeah, they're not, it's not really amazing typography. Um, certainly, if you think about um, what a magazine, a printed magazine looks like, you can't imagine this all being in one font. And yet, this page is all in one font. So, um, so, uh, if people wanted to use fonts on the web traditionally, then um, they would often make images of text. So if you scroll down here, you can see like there's that big brush text a bit further down. You can see this sans serif uh, text there, and this is an image. It's not text. So that means that you can't search for the text in the page. It means that search engines can't index it. It means that translate wouldn't work. It means that if you uh, you know have sight problems and you have the computer read that text out to you, it's not going to work. Um, so that's bad for all kinds of reasons, and uh, it's slow, especially on mobile. Um, and uh, this is, um, you know, Jagran e-paper. So this is, uh, you know, one of India's big newspapers, and its online version is all images. It's the print version scanned as an image, and there you go. You can kind of read it on the screen, but it's not really text. Um, so this is another Indian newspaper, and this is their mobile site, which looks a bit kind of weird on this huge laptop screen. But you can see this is also entirely image, and so it can be quite slow to load. So web fonts kind of changes that. Um, oh, there's one more thing. So another thing that happens with uh, with Indian languages on the web is that people have been using web fonts. Now it's available, but they've been using kind of older DTP era fonts. So that's not Unicode text. It's not like real text. So you can see down at the bottom here. That it's kind of like this kind of weird code. It's not real text, but it looks like that this is Bengali. So this this looks okay with its with this weird code plus the font. But if the font doesn't load, um, you know, because you're using a screen reader, an RSS reader, um, it's it's just not going to work. So web fonts, um, you know, they've been supported since about 2008 across the board, and as you can see now that basically they're supported everywhere, um, and. Uh, when web fonts kind of came out, there was a startup, Typekit, which has since been acquired by Adobe, and this offered a, you know a collection of high quality fonts for the web. And the font designers, when this technology you know came out, were uh, you know not too happy about it. They were very worried about uh, piracy, you know, people being able to use fonts without paying for them. And so Typekit did a lot of work to try and get more fonts online. But most people, you know, most designers just didn't 
know that web fonts was available that existed and so uh, one of Google's motivations for Google fonts was to provide no reason to not use web fonts right that there's no reason to use images of text there's no reason to use non unicode text anymore so um, this is uh, you know wide magazine and if you s this is kind of similar to the other magazine article that we showed a moment ago it's kind of plain but you know the the pull quotes um, they have a little bit more you know richness to them it's much more like a magazine experience and so this is another american magazine and this is all using google fonts and uh, yeah the atlantic this is a major uh, magazine so there's a nice extension for chrome called what font and that allows you to quickly see you know what fonts are in use on a page and uh, this is the rolling stone magazine and so this uh, page you just scroll down and the kind of interactive experience of this is you know, I think you know uh, as close to a digital magazine like a native magazine as we're going to get and the use of typography is absolutely essential to that magazine feel so yeah so the what font extension that's, that's good I recommend it so yeah so Google font so we've got um, a lot of fonts um, available in Latin um, and it's super super easy to use them. Um, so we're going to do a, a demonstration of this. Uh, so this is um, Hello Happy's beautiful web type and it has a small collection of examples of the fonts in use. And there's also the Fembot site which is also you know similar. Um, and these, these fonts, um, you know, they get used a lot. So this is a big number, you know, the total number of font views um, at, yeah, two and a half billion. And to kind of put that in context, um, you can see that um, the web fonts, you know, have been rising, right, that over the last few years, it's gone to about 50% of the top 1,000 web pages. So the most viewed video on YouTube, to put that big number in context, right, so Gangnam Style, the music video for Gangnam Style is the most popular video on YouTube. And that's been seen about two billion times. Open Sans, the most popular Google font, has been seen more than that. Um, and you know, you, you can have a web page without a video, but you can't have a web page without text. That's how important typography is. Um, yeah. So this idea of you know, the fonts fonts are kind of content infrastructure. Um, often you know it's, it's kind of surprising to see that fonts are used so much but when you think about it, yeah of course you you can't have a page without text and so fonts are really kind of content infrastructure and um, Google have been saying that you know that for this year they've been thinking about how they're going to reach the next billion people and so fonts are really a part of that story uh, if you scroll down one slide there yeah. So this is a quote from Rajan Anandan, who's the head of, you know, managing director of Google India, and uh, you know, it's absolutely crucial that as um, you know more people are coming online, uh, that content's available in the languages of their pride. You know, that people are going to get, uh, you know, these kinds of cheap Android phones. I picked this up about six months ago in India for uh, about fifty US dollars, and you know, Moore's law, right? That computers get about half of the price every two years. So this will be $25 uh, next year. It's like an old model. And uh, then there'll be like $15 two years after that. And then there'll be like $10 two years after that. And then like $5 two years after that. And so in the next, you know, kind of five to 10 years, everyone on the planet is going to get an internet phone. And uh, I think this is going to, you know, this is going to have uh, a lot of effects. But the typography is kind of infrastructure for that to happen, right? That those those people are going to get phones before they're going to learn English, um, and so it's very important for that content to be available in local languages. So um, this is an, these are some examples of these kind of traditional DTP era fonts, and um, Google has. Um, if you go to the Google Fonts page, there's this more scripts link up in the top right. 
and this is where some of those fonts are being made available. So often those fonts don't have you know, the, um, all of the features. The, the actual font service of early access is also kind of basic. It doesn't have all the features of the main Google font system. But you can see we've got like, yeah, Telugu, Korean, Thai, there's, there's a lot of fonts available in this early access page. So um, for you know, hopefully all the languages across India, across the world, then there'll be some fonts available. Um, but the, the focus this year has been on Devanagari. So this is the Basco website. And you can see if you use the what font uh, plugin on the toolbar there, um, then you can see that these, are, these guys are using their own web font, um, intro test. So it's a new thing. But if you, um, if you scroll down a bit there, Pavan, and get rid of the what font, then you can kind of see like that the integration of the Latin and the Devanagari, it's not, uh, you know, uh, really integrated because they're taking a DTP era font and you know improving it, testing it out on the web. But what we really need is new fonts designed, you know, uh, for the web that are integrated with Latin and other scripts. So um, I was very lucky that uh, when I decided to get into type design, I was a student in England, and so I was able to attend uh, the Typeface Design Masters program at the University of Reading, which is. Um, Actually, you know, it's, it's one of the best programs. Um, uh, people who aren't really familiar with typography and type design, I think it can sometimes look like a bit of a scam because there's a town in England called Reading, but it looks like it's the University of Reading with a font design course, which seems a bit dodgy. But it's actually the, the best course. Um, so uh, this is an example of a recent graduate's work. Um, and uh, you can see uh, this illustration in the specimen really kind of shows off uh, the kind of design and attention he put in to integrate the Latin and Canada scripts. So um, this year, we've been, or, and Google has been generously f giving type designers financial support to create new fonts for the web in this way. And so this is the Ek Mukta font by a foundry in Mumbai. Um, they're a new foundry. This is their first family. They've been working on it for uh, several years. And uh, when I met them at the Typo Day conference uh, in Pune earlier this year, then they agreed to make it available as a, as a free Libra Google font. So if we go up a bit, just a sec, Brandon. So this is another of their fonts, which is still in development. Um, so the first font you know, was very much a text font. Um, this is very much a display font. So this is a single style, and I think you know they've done an amazing job. Uh, this is really great stuff. So sorry, Bath, and get back a sec. And then the, the the other one in the PDF here at the bottom is Vespa, and so this is this is also available right now, and this is one of the um, student projects from the University of Reading. Um, that's consequently that's subsequently been you know developed, improved. Okay, so um, to show you how easy it is to use these fonts, uh, we're going to do a kind of quick demonstration. So, uh, yeah, so, so this is the um, uh, Mozilla WebMaker site. And so if any of you guys are kind of you know, getting into web development, you're learning about it, Mozilla um, are putting a lot of effort into making it easy for anyone to learn really nice quality web design work. And so as part of the WebMaker project, they offer some very nice uh, web-based tools. And one of them is called Mozilla Thimble. And um, yeah, so you can use Mozilla Thimble to create a web page very easily. So it gives you, you know, your basic HTML code here and then a live preview of it on the, on the side. So if you go to Google Fonts, you switch the uh, script to Devanagari. And then that shows you the font families that are available, which have some Devanagari glyphs in them. And you can add the families you're interested in to a collection. And so you can then review and compare them. And then you can hide your collection like this. And so you can see the text. Um, you can change the, the text here. Uh, you can say whether you want to consider this for headlines or, or paragraphs of text. And so um, we'll say we'll use Teco and Vespa. So we'll remove that from the collection. And then we'll go to the use page. And then we'll pick that we're going to use the bold version of Teco and the regular version of Vespa. And then we get this link tag, which we 
copy and paste into the head area of the HTML. And so what that does is it links the, um, the fonts into the page, so they're available. And then um, we need a little bit of style, so we open up a style tag. And then we say that we want um, this paragraph to use the font family Vesper Libra. And so you can see there that um, there's the system font and then there's the web font in use. And then we'll add a headline in there too. And then we'll say that we want that the headline, we're going to just copy and paste that in there. So we put the headline in Teco. And then, of course, we should probably have some Devanagari text. So, um, oh, oh, yeah, OK. Oh, great. Thank you. All right, so, uh, <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> so we'll take that and paste that in there. There we go. And we'll make and we'll make it a bit bigger. And uh, yeah, so you can see there's there's the the, the Devanagari and the Latin fonts in use together. So that's, that's how easy it can be to add the fonts to a page. And there's an example I made earlier. So um, yeah, so that's how easy it is. It's, you know, it's very fast, easy to add the fonts to a page. And Google Fonts has a lot of documentation about this. Um, there's a bunch of features. And I encourage you to, you know, to read and check it out, see how it all works. Um, if you go down, they have some nice effects. You can add you know, fire, stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that's, uh, these are Latin examples, but of course it just, it will work in Devanagari as well. Okay, so, um, so that's the technical details about how to use these fonts. So I now want to talk a little bit about why you would want to do this. So um, there was this nice article I saw in the news uh, this week by a Marketing Land website, and um, it has this very nice demonstration here about you know, how font designs affect us emotionally. And typography can drive behavior. You know, if, uh, if you see um, the typography and it kind of doesn't really match the emotional tone of, of the stuff you're looking at, then it can be quite disconcerting. And um, this was an interesting study done by a documentary maker a few years ago, where he, um, he had an article um, about uh, asteroids impacting the Earth. You know, it's like a, a big danger, maybe. Dinosaurs got wiped out that way. Is that something that humans should be worried about? Could we do something to prevent asteroids killing us all? Maybe, yes, no. Well, so he had this article about that issue and he set the article in a bunch of different fonts. And then he asked people whether they thought the article saying that we should be worried about this was true or not. And the fonts affected how people evaluated that question. And so the, the top font here, Baskerville, people found that very authoritative and they felt that, yes, the article was more likely to be, to be true if it was in that font as opposed to, say, Comic Sans. So, um, yeah, um, th the way that typography you know, shapes our behavior, I think, is a kind of subliminal advertising. And so it's important to consider typography and to get it right.
So on the web, um, who, who's um, you doing kind of A-B testing of their designs on the web? One person? A couple of people, okay. So I think something that's very interesting about the web is, is you know, it's very cheap to put stuff out there. And so you can set up a system where half of your visitors get one version of your site and half of your visitors get another version. And then you can measure which version's doing better. And so um, in, in Europe, there's a very strong convention that construction, like building services, are colored yellow, you know, like, like you know, diggers and stuff like that, right? The machinery's traditionally been branded yellow. And so if you have a website like that and you don't color it yellow, you get less visitors, you get less engagement, because the color, uh, you know, in the design is, is also shaping behavior. So um, if you start introducing typography, it's, it's really good, I think, to test the effects of, you know, of, of the typography. Um, and if you don't know anything about typography, you don't know where to start, then this is a great book. It's called The Non-Designers Design and Type Book. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's got a lot of examples of before and after applying typography and design principles. Um, and so uh, another project that I've been involved in is to try and really make this uh, more advanced level typography knowledge available to everyone in the world. So there's this project, Open Educational Resources for Typography, led by um, some design teachers at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And it's a complete typography textbook that they've produced for themselves at their university. And uh, when I went down to Argentina to work with uh, South American type designers, then um, they said that you know they had this textbook and they want to make it available. And so there's an official version where they've done quality control. And then there's a kind of live version, which anybody can join, participate, and edit using the GitHub collaboration platform. And uh, yeah. So um, kind of getting re really down into typography, you often want to create your own typefaces. And so another project that you know, I see is very democratic is this FontForge project. So this is a font editor, which um, is a free Libra open source software. Anyone can use, anyone can download. Um, it's available for Mac, Windows, um, and uh, it has a very nice tutorial called Design with FontForge. And again, this is like a, a kind of a kind of basic textbook about, at the moment, Latin type design. Although I'm hoping that we're going to, you know, increasingly add more information. Um, so based on some of the experiences of the designers making new Devon Agari fonts this year, um, we're starting to increase, you know, try and improve the access to knowledge there. Um, there's also a, um, a designer developer who works at Wikipedia in India, and he's made the um, Indic font book, which provides some of the technical information that you need in order to make uh, Indic fonts work well. So this, this process of creating these new Devon Agari fonts this year, um, you know, is, is, is very much a kind of a experimental process where some of the designers have got experience, they've done uh, Devon Agari and Latin type designs before, you know, some of them are trained at University of Reading, um, but some of the designers haven't, and, you know, they've either, uh, they're, you know, uh, Latin type designers who are very technically capable and have not so much familiarity with Devanagari, or their Devanagari designers who don't have so much technical um, yeah, experience. So um, we have this discussion forum uh, where people are posting their work in progress for review, and uh, you know I encourage you to jump in and if you really you know think this is interesting, um, review the fonts, give comments, feedback. The designers would love to hear from you. And so, yeah, this is some example of work in progress. There's also um, these general critique forums. So if you're interested in doing type design um, as a kind of hobby, then you can do some work, post it up on these review boards, and other type designers will, you know, kind of review it, give you comments and feedback. So the, the lobster font, um, is everyone familiar with this? <laughs> it's a pretty famous font. It was one of the top, it was like the top font on Google Fonts for a long time. And um, that was made entirely uh, in this process. So the designer, Pablo Impolari, was down in Argentina. And um, he was a web designer. And he became interested in type design. And using those forums, he posted his work in progress, get feedback, and eventually made this beautiful font, which is extremely popular. 
but this this kind of um, you know kind of iterative process is a little bit controversial. Um, so there was this nice this very nice typography blog Typographica, which posted this uh, article about Roboto, which was a font made by a designer inside Google for Android, and he said it was a Franken font and terrible uh, because uh, and a very early version had been released. Um, as part of a software preview for Android. So it was kind of work in progress. And um, I, I really think about this as um, a, uh, a kind of web native approach to design, right? It's very iterative that you can start a type design, you can make it a reasonable level of quality that it's, you know, it's useful to some extent. It may not be as good as it could be, but if it's useful, then I think that that's at the stage where people could use it. And so, uh, fonts are almost never finished. There's always problems with fonts, right? They're, they're very complex pieces of software. Um, the design often, you know, needs to be changed for different contexts. And this is actually my original motivation for getting into type design. That when I was doing design work, often the fonts I was using didn't have the weights I wanted, or the punctuation wasn't designed quite right. It was too small or too big. Um, uh, the language support sometimes wasn't there. You know, it only supported uh, English. It didn't support all European languages. <coughs> and so, disability for designers uh, who were the users of the fonts to kind of work in community with the original designers of the type um, to improve them or to customize them for themselves, I think, is important. And um, this is, you know, very much part of a wider movement of free Libra software, um, Creative Commons uh, design work. And so um, GitHub is this kind of platform for collaboration. And so I encourage you guys, you know, if you're not familiar with GitHub, um, they have great documentation and uh, it's a great kind of backup system. It's a version control system in your design work so that instead of going file, save as, this is the final design, file, save as, this is the final, final, final design. Uh, you, you don't do that. Uh, you just have the design and then there's a system which manages the versions. And that allows you to you know, go back in time when you need to. Um, it allows you to share work collaboratively. If two people make two changes to the same file um, and it's a text file, they could be merged. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a very nice system. So I'm trying to move the fonts onto uh, GitHub this year. And mostly the fonts are licensed under the open font license. And uh, this license allows this kind of free modification. Um, sometimes um, there's a kind of trademark with the fonts so that if you modify them, you have to change the name because the original designer has made it under that name and it's recognized as that name. And you have your version, you change the name. Um, so. You know, I've, I've kind of, you know, I got into type design to work on free fonts because uh, I think this is something that I want, right? I want the freedom to modify the fonts for me. Um, and the the big question that comes up is, well, what about the money? Right? How are you going to get paid if you're going to make something and give it away? So for me, I, 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 this is, making money, you know, is is obviously it's important. But to me, it wasn't like the most important thing. You know, if I wanted to make money, I'd go work in London banks or something. You know, working as a designer is because I like design. Uh, it's not the the primary thing for me is is the designing. The money kind of comes out of that. Um, so I was never too worried about you know how was I going to earn money making Libra free fonts to give away to everyone, because I always I kind of figured that if you do something that's valuable then people see that value and they want to exchange that value for money. And so the service of creating new fonts or modifying fonts uh, you know, is, is, a, is a business model. And actually, a lot of type designers don't make that much money selling copies of fonts because everyone pirates fonts. So actually, a lot of the money, the real money is made doing custom work for branding uh, you know, for clients on a service basis. So these Libra fonts are modifiable by anyone in the world. And the open font license does have a restriction on selling the fonts by themselves. Um, it's kind of like a, a kind of fairness idea that if the original designer has made the font you know, freely available, then if you're going to go selling copies, well, it's not, not really fair because you're not paying royalties to them. So um, it doesn't restrict 
you know, that design service of modifying the fonts for a fee for a client. So if you're doing logo design, branding, identity work, then you can take these Libra fonts and you can provide custom versions to your clients. And if the custom version involves like chopping off one of the letters in some cool way and it takes you five minutes, well, that's not a big change. And so the client's probably not going to be happy to pay you a load of money for that, but they'll probably pay you something. You know, if they're going to pay you for a logo and other branding work, then there's no reason that they wouldn't pay for a kind of semi-custom typeface. A lot of companies use Helvetica for their branding, so you don't need a totally custom thing, but having something that's a little bit customized for you can be a great story, it can be a great piece of the, the marketing and the branding. Um, so who's heard of Kickstarter? A few people. Okay, I think if you refresh the page, it should come up. Yeah, so Kickstarter um, is a pretty, pretty famous website, um, and it's a funding platform. So I said earlier, you know, web publishing is cheap. It's cheap to make fonts, uh, to, to, make, um, to web, make web pages and just put them out there. And so on Kickstarter, it makes it really easy for someone to put up a web page trying to sell a project before the project has happened. It's kind of pre-sales. And the way that it, it kind of is safe for the customers is that you're totally upfront that the thing doesn't exist. It's not like a scam where you're like, give me money and then, oh, it's delay, delay, you know. It's, it's very upfront. It was saying, we, here's this idea that something we want to do and we need a certain amount of money to make it happen. You know, we need a certain amount of capital investment to be raised. But instead of going to like an investor and getting that money and maybe losing control of the project, you go to your potential customers and you say, if enough people sign up and say that they, they want this to happen, and they promise to give money if enough other people also promise to give money, then we'll do it. But if not enough people are interested, then nobody sends any money and the whole thing just you know, disappears. So um, we can see if we go to the, uh, the design section of the Kickstarter site, then yeah, you can see there's a lot of uh, design projects here. This one's being highlighted on the home page, and so we can see um, there's about 35% funded. They've got $1,500, so I guess they need like yeah, 5,000 bucks or so. Um, and 26 people have signed up in the last week to say, you know, yes, this looks like a cool project. So if you click through there, this is for a block of wood. Cool. So you can see on the right that you've got this list of backing options. So the, the $33 pledge, you get your little wood block and uh, thank you. And then for an extra 15 bucks, you get it in a special kind of wood. And then for 50 bucks, you get like a big one. Um, yeah. So you can see, you know, you can, you can pledge more and more money to support the project and you get more and more in return. Um, so that's Kickstarter. Um, the model of Kickstarter maybe doesn't work totally well for things where you're going to give them away to everyone in the world at the end, because there's a free rider issue, right? People say, well, that's a nice project, but if I don't send anything, other people will send money, and then I'll just get it at the end. So um, there's, there's different funding models, um, and this is one of my favorite. It's called Fund.io, and the idea is that this allows you to use the power of copying to um, as part of the revenue model. So he has, the author has some very nice blog posts explaining how it all works, um, some nice diagrams, and uh, yeah. I think this is a very exciting idea, but nobody's actually really, um, as far as I know, kind of implemented it for, for real projects yet. It's kind of an academ academic idea. Now, Kickstarter itself um, doesn't actually operate in India. So you can, uh, you can buy stuff, you know, pick Kickstarter projects, but you can't create your own Kickstarter projects. So I think, I don't think we have a tab for this. I think you have to search for it. So if you search for Kickstarter equivalent in India, pick a venture. And this is some, some startup that's offering the same kind of uh, funding platform um, in India, you know, by Indians for Indians. And there's probably more uh, if you guys are into this kind of stuff. I'm sure if you search around, you can find other platforms. So uh, I, I tried to do this with some font projects. And um, you know, because they were kind of being backstopped by Google, all of the projects appear to be very successful. You know, they all kind of met their funding goal. But that was often because Google topped them up. 
Um, however, there was one, Montserrat, which you can see got double the uh, funding amount with no help from Google because um, the video that the designer made was, was really nice and it really resonated with people. Um, and uh, yeah, she, she got you know, double the target amount that she originally wanted. Um, so I have had more success with this kind of win-win idea. So um, one of the issues with web fonts is that they, um, especially on older Windows XP computers, you know, the, the pixelization rendering of the, the, of the fonts can sometimes you know, be bad. And so there's a system in Windows called hinting, which allows you to customize the pixelization of the fonts. And so um, I had an idea that we could use the non-Windows font rendering systems which have a kind of intelligence built into them to do a better rendering. And we could take that and put it back in the fonts so that when they're used on Windows, they look good. So there's a little program. Uh, we made a little video and tried to raise some money. And you can see if you click the donate button on the top right there, that by approaching companies who also had this problem, where they had a lot of old DDP error fonts they wanted to convert to the web, um, that they could donate substantial amounts of money. And so if you go up to the top, you can see that we raised over $50,000 so far by approaching companies to give ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 at a time. So um, there's, a, there's a book called The um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think I had to search for that one again. And so this is like a super famous, super cheesy business book. Do you guys know this? A few of you guys? Yeah, so, so it's, it's a very famous American business book. Um, it's the kind of thing you'd see like in an airport. It's kind of, kind of cheesy. Um, but one of, the, one of the ideas in that is like win-win, right? This idea that, um, uh, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's people who um, are not totally interested uh, in um, my ideas about Libra fonts and having fonts which are free and modifiable. But there are companies which are working with fonts um, where they're you know, restricted, they're not allowing modification, they're asking people to pay for each copy. But they have this problem where they need to improve the hinting. And so that's like a win-win situation where they had the same problem that I did and um, they were, you know, we could work together. So this idea of win-win of, you know, opportunities I think is important to think about, uh, especially when, when doing something where you want to give it away. So if you can find someone else who wants to benefit from that thing existing, and they don't really, you know, they're not so interested in um, charging for it directly, but they need it for themselves, then that's like that win-win situation. So that's the answer, basically. Um, how do you fund something to give it away for free? Well, there's, you know, uh, the possibility of finding customers before you've made it, um, and there's these kind of win-win opportunities out there. So, um, I, uh, you know, I. This time, this time I'm visiting India, I see some big billboards on the highways for Android One. Um, so this is, as I say, a phone I picked up uh, six months ago. Um, so these Android One phones, Google's making a big effort to kind of bring the cost down, bring the power and the features of these cheap phones up. And uh, having good web typography in all the world's languages is essential to um, the spread of the internet, um, the spread of education, the spread of culture. So uh, I, I encourage you who are designers to you know, focus on typography. I think it's often kind of overlooked how, how powerful it can be. And um, I encourage you to really get you know, into it and learn to design your own typefaces. I think it's fun. I don't think it's too serious. A lot of type designers make it very serious. But I don't think so. I think that, you know, um, it's, it's something which you can have fun with. And we're, by producing these Libra fonts, you can play around with them. You're allowed to modify them. It's encouraged. And um, I think that, yeah, the, the future of typography in India is really just beginning. Thank you. And so if you want to contact us after, the, after the, we're going to be around for questions, but if you want to contact us, you can hit us up on Twitter. We're easy to find. Um, yeah, OK. OK, I'm just going to start off the question and answer yeah. uh, round with a little bit of 
uh, questions of my own. Uh -huh. um, first of all, it's really cool to know that typeface in itself is such a big world. I don't think too many of us here uh -huh. know about this. Yeah. And of course, even the course of uh, typeface design that you've been through at university. Uh, I'm interested to know what the course structure would have been like. Uh -huh. If you could tell us a little about that. And also, um, uh, if this ha would have any sort of hardware implications on our cell phones and laptops, you know, something like this. Um, a project of this kind. Uh, so you have an on-screen keyboard. Um, I think that the on-screen keyboards for Indian languages right. are not very good. Yeah. And I'm sure that they'll be improved. Um, and I think you can get, you know, third-party keyboards for Android, you know, which where people are attempting to improve them. I know that there's a, a project at the IITB IDC, the Industrial Design Center at the IIT Bombay, um, have been working on um, better keyboard input for Android. Because I was there a few months ago, and I was like, wow, that's cool. Um, so yeah, you, you can find that online for sure. Um, and yeah, content you know content creation in Indian languages is um, improving, right? So there's the fonts need to improve, keyboard input needs to improve, um, uh, search engines need to improve, all that stuff. And um, if you open a new tab, Patham, if you search for um, Zuckerberg Modi. Okay, well, somewhere on the internet, there's a quote um, about um, Mark Zuckerberg saying that Facebook are also very interested in content creation in local languages in India. And um, they you know, met with the Prime Minister. What are the languages they're targeting? Are there any set languages? The Devanagari writing system covers you know, many languages. So obviously right. Hindi, Marathi, Nepali, Sindhi, some others. And um, that's about 40% of Indian. Okay population um, and then and that's something like 300 million people and then after that there's a bunch of languages which are um, spoken by about 50 million people it's like you know 55 50 45 40 and then there's a few more which are down like 20 million and there's a few which are like a few million um, and so yeah the nature of business is prioritizing and so the the Devanagari fonts that Google have been commissioning this year um, are mainly for those three, you know, Hindi, Marathi, Nepali, um, and maybe some of the fonts um, will support uh, the Vedic uh, glyphs um, for more. I guess that's more like academic and historical writing. Um, and um, the Google Fonts project, you know, it's, it's about making free Libra fonts widely available. So. Um, if you make a Libra font and you contact me, we can put it in the system. And um, uh, there are, you know, a small number of fonts available for other languages, which are going into that early access page. And once, you know, once the fonts are under that free Libra license, they can evolve and improve over time. And so this week we added about 20 Telugu fonts. Or I added 20 Telugu fonts um, to the early access page. As I say, I, I really feel like this is right. We're at the beginning of this, right? So um, it's going to take time. So, um, like in the uh, Franken font uh, article, I, I actually have famously low standards. <laughs> um, so, uh, to me, if the font's available under a Libra license, then it means that there's no restrictions on it being improved, other than the restrictions of organising, you know, the, the, the expertise and time, uh, you know, and, and labour time. Uh, you know, raising money to pay people to do it, or motivating them to do it, um, or whatever. So, to me, that's like the most important thing. And I think about this over the long term, right? Over 20 years, um, those fonts are going to improve somehow, or they're not, and they'll just, you know, they won't get used very much because if they're not good, they won't get used much. Um, and I remember when Wikipedia first came out, you know, it wasn't very good, and now most of the time it's very good. Um, so, so that's kind of, yeah, how, how do we evaluate things? Well, um, I'm willing to put stuff out there and Google has this platform to make fonts available. And if they meet minimum standards of technical quality, then, uh, you know, we give them a shot. Um, and the early access page is really, you know, the kind of buffer for that. So the idea is, is that the fonts that are in the main directory, you know, should be good quality. How would you uh, define good quality in a font? 
So this is Font Forge, and then here's a Telugu font on top. And if you double click that blue glyph, so this shape, this is just like kind of picked at random. So basically every every glyph in this font, right? So this is one of these um, donated fonts from an organization called Silicon Andra, which is I think like a non-profit it's related to the government. I'm not 100% sure on on the background of the organization, um, but they've made about 20. Uh, free Libra fonts available, and these are kind of DTP fonts that they've, you know, converted to Unicode. And so, to me, the shape of this, like, it's a little bit asymmetrical. Maybe that could be improved. Um, if you close this window, let's pick another glyph. Uh, this one. Uh, hold down the tilde. Okay, so this is a bit subtle. I don't know how if you if you guys can really see this, but you see this curve. You see here, there's kind of a kink in it. That's kind of subtle. Uh, there we go. So that shouldn't be like that. I think that should be smoother. And um, yeah, so 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 it can be down to that level, right? The 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 technical quality of the fonts. And the aesthetic quality of fonts are, are related. So this has got lots of points, which means the file size is big, which means it takes a long time for the font to load. And on mobile, it's not good. Uh, about education, so um, the University of Reading, um, there are there are scholarship programs. So if you you know are getting into type design, you have examples of your work, um, then you can apply and you can get like a funded place to go there. Um, there's other schools around the world. So the other um, top school um, is the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague in Holland. Um, and um, there's also the Cooper Union in New York City. Um, and then uh, there's the um, CDT course in Buenos Aires. Um, those are all master's programs. And then there's increasingly, you know, as graduates, um, of those master's programs become teachers at design colleges around the world, then they're teaching. And so there's a couple of graduates um, who are living in Bangalore uh, who were working with me on some fonts this year. Um, one of them was teaching at Shrishti College, but she's now uh, gone traveling. Um, yeah, so this is very much like a growing trend. And so the opportunities to, um, to get like a, a really dedicated education in this are growing. The course structure at the University of Reading, well, the University of Reading is really a university. And so the department of typography there is very unusual in the world. Mostly design is taught within arts colleges um, and uh, or design colleges. So I know that there's the NID in Ahmedabad, which is you know focused entirely on design, whereas my understanding is that Srishti here in Bangalore is an, an arts college. Right? So the University of Reading is, is even more unusual than a design college because it's a real university doing design. And so they're really trying to make typography and, and a, they're kind of turn typography from an arts practice into a humanities discipline. So they treat it more like history or psychology and um, they work, they encourage you, know, you to attend psychology classes, history classes, um, to work with historians and psychologists uh, on researching typography. And it's a very academic environment. So their typefacedesign.net website has examples of all the student work. And um, yeah, so the, the course is very intense. They, they basically require you to go full time for one year. Um, they don't want you to have a job at the same time. So you've got to live in England for a year without a job. <laughs> Uh, so you need that scholarship, <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, it's the first term. Then you do experimental work. Uh, the second term, you do a major typeface project, which these are PDFs are showing, and then the third term is your um, dissertation, where you have to write a ten thousand word English dissertation on you know some as kind of academic analysis of type design. And so this website has some of the dissertations. Um, and the yeah, the dissertations, some of them are online. And we actually have this very nice book, uh, Size Specific Adjustments to Type Design, uh, which is one of the master's dissertations that was you know turned into a book by its author. Um, and I don't know how well you guys can see this, but the, the red and the blue, are, it's the same font family, but it's been designed for different point sizes. So the eight point version that's used, you know, for like captions and images is designed to be a little bit wider spaced, a little bit more blocky. 
And then the blue version is designed for, you know, like 70 point use. And the thin parts are much thinner in the serifs. Um, you know, the proportions, the X height is different and so on. So, yeah, when you really, really get into really fine typography, uh, you can really <laughs> get uh, lost in, in the subject. Hey, hey, Dave. So uh, one of the questions I had was, so one of the things I keep thinking about is uh, in the offline world here, right? You look at signage all around the city. It's it's very inconsistent. And mm -hmm. and uh, given that it, this is India and we have multiple languages, uh, typical signage has whatever, three or four languages or, or you know, something like that. Um, so my... Uh, what I was thinking was, is there a way to bridge whatever you're doing here with the, the offline world as well and see if you can leverage some of this, you know, um, in offline signages and so on, work with the government to, to establish consistent signage you know, across the city, across different languages and so on. Um, is that something you see happening or you think this is completely restricted to the online world at this time? Uh, yeah, so, so these fonts, um, I mean, when I say that they're designed for the web, then um, often that means the, actually these kinds of size designs, right? That if you're designing something for using a billboard, um, then the, the shapes of the letters would be different to if you're designing it for a small pixel screen. But that being said, there's no, there's no restrictions on the usage of the fonts. That's what it means to be a free Libra font, right? That there's no restrictions on use. There's no restrictions on modification or distribution. Um, so, so you can use these fonts in print. Um, it's very easy to download them from the Google Fonts site. There's a, um, a little download button on the top right uh, where you add the fonts you're interested in to a collection. And then you click the download button and you get a zip and you install them and you can use them in print, you know, in whatever applications you're using. Um, in terms of improving typography across India, well, that's not something I'm going to do, but that's something you guys are going to do. Um, you should contact the government, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think that typography is very subliminal, right? That when we're reading, we read the content and it's actually like difficult to, to see the typography itself because you focus so much on the content. So this is totally weird. I thought this was a nice metaphor for typography. So this is four circles, but it looks like a spiral. It's, made, it's difficult to look at it directly. It's weird. And typography is like that, right? The, like when you're looking at words, your mind wants to read it and not think about how it looks. Hmm. So um, with, with those kinds of things where, you know, if you have like the, the government that's doing road signage and you're trying to convince them to commission a new typeface or to improve the typography, they could, like, people would say, well, why? Like, it, it, people can read it. What's wrong with you? But if you show them the difference, that the improvement, you know, you say something before which is not good and something which has been redesigned to be better, people can feel the difference. They can say, oh yeah, that, that's better. But it's difficult to, to be able to anticipate that if you're not a designer and you don't have experience with typography. Well, as a designer, I've never really um, made my own type typeface. I've always modified it. So I've always been interested in the technical details behind what goes into making a typeface. So if you could just give me a gist of how do I start? So um, for lettering and logo design, then um, I think the, the number one concept I can give you is this idea of an imaginary pen. So when you're drawing um, uh, a letter form, then the kinds of shapes that you see remind you of what a pen stroke could do, but often they would be impossible to do with real calligraphy. And something that separates, you know, something which looks, you know, well, well executed from something that looks amateurish is the consistency of the imaginary pen, right? The, the forms across the typeface look like they've come from the same kind of speed of movement, the same kind of structure. Um, and um, yeah, that's, I think, very useful. If you do something, then you stop, you, you st take a step back, you analyze it, and you can have a very intuitive sense of whether this looks you know, uh, familiar um, or too familiar and boring or too unfamiliar and weird and you know, not, 
not good or you know it's about like getting that balance between something that's original and conventional in terms of doing a typeface going beyond a few letters in a logo to a whole typeface then um, a kind of classic beginner's error is to like do the whole alphabet and then try and improve that and it's like there's so much complexity in building up a system of shapes in a typeface what you need to do is pick out uh, is do a kind of analysis of the writing system and your design and figure out what the individual unique parts are and make a small number of letters which have these different parts. So in Latin, the University of Reading um, encourages students to use the word adhesion because if you take a large piece of English text and you analyse it for the most common letters, then it's most of those letters which are right at the top. Um, Another foundry uses video span because that has more of like a shape analysis. You know, there's a diagonal, some verticals, some rounds. So whatever writing system you're doing, you can kind of think about the design you have in mind, the different shapes that are involved. And by having a small number of letters, you reduce the complexity so that when you change one thing, you have to review that in context with the other things and then make other changes. And you know, in, in a, if you have many letters, then it gets really, really a long process to rechange everything all the time. So you have this first stage where you have a small number of letters, and then you need to make a test text so that you can see what that small number of letters would be like in a paragraph. Because that's really what you're designing. You're designing text, not letters. So you need to get a small number of letters into text and then that gives you that, that feedback where you can have that intuitive look. And then the second stage is where you get a full alphabet and you can make real text. And then that kind of weird thing happens where you stop seeing it as shapes and start seeing it as, as reading text. Um, that's kind of you know, the, the dramatic revealing moment where you find out if what you're doing is going to work as text. Yeah, that, that's you know, just going from a logo type to one font. And then the next level is thinking about designing families. Because often you're designing typefaces, you know, for, you're designing type for document usage, where you're structuring information, and so you have different visual styles in the family for different parts of information to produce that visual hierarchy. So, in the same way that you, um, you know, make a few letters to begin with for the one face, then you would make a few letters for the lightweight, for the bold weight, for the narrow, for the wide, and then you'll find, you know, design problems to solve early on before you go and make the whole alphabet and you're like, oh, these letters are too wide, you know. So um, it's absolutely about iteration. It's about trusting your own intuition about that balance between originality and convention. So if you go to Google Fonts, um, then you can see that there's this download button. So if you add Open Sans to your collection, you go to download, then it says, um, yeah, uh, it says do, that's bad. Okay, but uh, there we go. There we go. So it says you can download it as a zip file. That's good. And you'll get the true type fonts, which is the same fonts that are being used on the web. And that's because, you know, most, most common cases that designers want to use the fonts for prototyping the websites. They want the same fonts that are on the web. But what you want is a bit different, right? You want the print fonts. And so you want to go to get the source files. And currently those are on the Google Code project. But as I say, they are moving to GitHub. So um, if you go to the Google font directory, then um, you can see there's some information about downloading the source files. And if you go to um, the source tab here and then browse, um, you can see a kind of uh, some of the fonts available in the font folder. Then you have the true type fonts. So you go to the OFL section. Yeah, so, so the Google code site isn't meant for a huge collection like this. So it only lists like, I don't know, was that 50 of the fonts? Um, but yeah, so let's see. Uh, we're moving the fonts to GitHub. Um, and so on. It, it should be that when you look at the fonts description, you see there's a link to GitHub and then you go to GitHub and then they have the original sources uh, you know, the designer is actually using to make the font with. So it's not just like the OTF, but it's actually the real full sources. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. 
All right, so when you ask somebody to draw a letter, then typically they'll draw the outline rather than, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll draw the outline. So you might have somebody and they would, you know, they draw a stroke like this and a stroke like this, and that's not really a sketch, that's writing. So when they sketch, then they might draw an outline like this. But the, the problem with that approach is that that is how the computer represents it, but as you saw in the demo, you can just have the computer instantly fill it in so that you can see the black shapes and then the white shapes that are created by the black shapes. And this idea of you know, negative space is a very common you know, concept in InDesign, um, and it's essential to type design. So when you're sketching, you can, rather than using the pen to draw lines, you can use the pen in a kind of forwards and backwards motion to create area. And that allows you to control the stroke, the width of the stroke, and the angle at the same time. And so this allows you to sketch the letter form in its proportions, in its black and its white shapes simultaneously, and allows you to go very fast. And then um, there's a kind of trick, which is that for calligraphy in Latin, then you would typically have that kind of pen angle. And in Devanagari, then it would be more like, more like that angle. So by using the, the pen and keeping the angle the same, then you get um, a kind of calligraphic feeling and as, as I said, we had this idea of the imaginary pen, right? So sketching this way is, is, is uh, easier than doing real calligraphy because you can create the same kinds of forms that a broad nib pen would create, but you can also do impossible things because it's sketching. Um, so, so that's really kind of like the big secret to sketching letter forms, that instead of doing the line first and then filling it in, which is what you would kind of obviously do, you want to flip it around and do the area first, and then when you have the proportions, then you would do the outline contour to um, you know, kind of confirm that that's what you wanted. And so if you do the area like this and you think, no, this should be longer, then when you do the contour to confirm the drawing, then you can, you can get that edge uh, that's very clear about the shape. And then the third stage would then be to go in and really fill the letter in like really black so you really get that sharp sense of the black and the white. And then the fourth stage would be to put another sheet on top and do it again and again and again. And as I say, you know, core of design is iteration. And so with sketching, you can very quickly throw down ideas and then step back and look at them and think, well, is this, does this have the right kind of feeling that I'm going for? And then you can do it again and improve it. And then when you have the idea kind of pinned down, then you can go to the computer and you can either scan your drawing and trace it, or what I would recommend is to redraw the shape, you know, redraw the idea without tracing, so that you are kind of like, it's like into the gym, you know, like you wanna um, uh, do the lightweights at the beginning, and so that's kind of like taking the drawing and tracing it. But you really need to build up that, that kind of power and skill about drawing thing that you want to see with the Bezier tools um, quickly, directly. And so I don't recommend taking a scan and tracing it. I recommend thinking about the idea and then re-executing that idea digitally. Uh, so that's how I see sketching leading to digital design. If you guys uh, want to hear more about this, um, I'd like to invite uh, Patham, my friend, up to the stage. So um, Patham's a type designer from Sri Lanka and uh, uh, he's, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, very passionate about typography. I met him at the typography conference in Pune about six months ago, uh, where he was presenting some of his work on uh, making interesting new ideas in type design. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I've been, like, working on, like, 
typography for last like one and a half year or so like uh, at college and then afterwards as well uh, <coughs> one of the the first things that i was thinking was like i i did my like degree in graphic design and i get got interested in type design and um, then when i like thought of like moving into type design rather than doing like direct visual design and web design but i was like the biggest problem i had was actually like this part of world we have like a lot of other problems that as a designer as a creative person that we can solve using our creative skills the thinking and as well as time you know like you know like child abuse or whatever right so uh, actually is is this like something that i want to take on you know making like letters like beautiful letters is this something can i do something about it because i've been always like passionate about all these like problems we have but then when i was doing like research and you know like when I, because i was like really into the letters and i loved letters then i realized actually there are some things that we can do but the thing is now in sri lanka sri lanka because it's my experience uh none of the the publishers use like proper new unicode system fonts uh, for publishing in native languages because of this the, the all the content is in like old formats and this cannot be translated into new web formats or like you know text to speech systems where blind people can access uh, the native uh, content as well so it, for like last 30 years none of this content has been translated and another thing is having this knowledge like there's vast knowledge out there in the internet itself and getting that knowledge into the new masses who are getting phones like, on like you know like uh, as he said like this like uh, 2000 3000 rupee phones they they everybody is getting this phone so getting the content across the knowledge if rather than you know helping with them like charity or anything getting them across the knowledge and the the rich experience uh, could help a country uh, and you know development as well so that's why i got into it and i'm i'm really uh, i really like the approach of libre fonts and how the whole system works because i think again like this part of the world uh, like people want invest even like big corporations want invest money into design work or rather like you know fonts specifically uh, but if 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 we can you know work on a, like a, if if lot of people like group of people can get together and work to uh, develop a, gr a set of fonts uh, that all industry can then benefit from it and now in sri lanka we are trying to do this where like all the the advertising agencies and web companies are chipping in to develop like 50 fonts for sri lanka so that so th this kind of like approach so all these fonts will be available freely to use like used by any publisher or like like small time graphic designer or whoever so because in in our area i think the biggest like the the most of the design work not the not the the commercial or the the finance value but most of the visual work that you can see happens in small places like you know this like small computer shops and digital printing places and so if you actually want to improve the visual quality it's it's not about just getting nice fonts into advertising agencies but getting everything available to like all these smaller places you know small time digital printers communication centers and you know all these places so i think the libre approach is the only way to achieve this right now in like this part of the world i guess so that's something that you know i I've, I've been thinking yeah so yeah. Thank you so much, Dave and Patham, for taking time off to uh, introduce us all to this big world of its own. Uh, we have a little something for you as a small gift from Creative Mornings. Um, since Diwali, the Indian festival is around the corner, we thought, um, why not give you some tiyas, like a multi-purpose tiya. Thank you. Thank you once again.